Hello, this is Pastor Michael with Reform Fellowship Church, and I would just like to take this opportunity before the video begins to thank you for listening, and to also encourage you that if you find these videos edifying and encouraging in your walk with Jesus Christ, to please like and comment in the video below. We would also love it if you would reach out to us and tell us how God is using our ministry to help you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You can do that by finding us online. Our website is www.rfcdover.com. We would also encourage you to subscribe to the channel and make sure you click on the notification bell because if you do, you'll be notified every single time that we put a new video up for you to enjoy and use. Now please enjoy this video and may the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you. Well, before we begin our look at the second part of John 18, please again join me in prayer. Father, we, we desire to honor you with our lips, with our actions, with our thoughts. You have given us those desires by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. We also ask that through that same Holy Spirit that you would help us today as we study your word to hear it, to understand it, to put it into practice. Lord, that it would encourage us, that it would embolden us, that it would help us to put a greater faith and trust in you, that it would help us to be encouraged in these dark times, knowing that this too shall pass, that you who came to save us are coming back for us. So Lord, we just ask and thank you for uh, this time together and ask that you help it be fruitful for us in our spiritual walk with you and fruitful for your kingdom. For it's in your name we pray and wish to glorify you. Amen. John 18, part two. Jesus is about to face Annas and Caiaphas. And we'll just jump right into it. This is coming off of the heels of Jesus being arrested or giving himself up for arrest. And remember, we had that imagery in our minds where we corrected it last time, where a lot of us have seen movies or have just had the images in our own minds where when Jesus is being arrested, it's maybe 12 to 20 uh, officers and soldiers and men from the, uh, from the priests and the Pharisees. And we have this kind of image in our mind, but, but that's blown away when we realize that it was hundreds of men who were coming to take Jesus and so we have this all in mind, that Jesus is the great I am. He says, they ask, he, he asks, who are you here for? And they say, we're here for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And they fall down, right? Christ, once again, showing his deity, showing his power, equating himself with God the Father by the statement of saying he is I am. And so he is showing that he's in control of this situation. He is allowing himself to be taken all to fulfill God's redemptive plan. And what we're about to read here is also part of God's redemptive plan. So in John 18, verse 12, So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. They didn't have to bind him. He would have went willingly. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. So just quickly, Annas was not the official high priest, but he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas. And he was, so to speak, the power behind that position, the power behind the throne. He uh, still wielded influence over the office. He was still controlling things behind the scenes, even though his son-in-law Caiaphas was the one who hold the, held the official position. But he had many of his sons and son-in-laws were part of this position. So this, this man, Annas, held quite a bit of power and, and authority. Two trials occurred here, one Jewish and one Roman. The Jewish one began with this informal meeting with Annas giving time for all the Sanhedrin to gather, because remember, it's the middle of the night. This is not the normal time that the Sanhedrin would gather. The Roman phase of trial would become uh, apparent when he meets with Pilate. Here we have Caiaphas' name being mentioned. He's the one that's going to be ultimately making the final decision before Jesus is sent to Pilate. Verse 15, Simon Peter followed Jesus. 
And so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You, are also, are, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. At this point, you see how Peter is just full of of contradictions, right? He was really on fire for the Lord with a sword in his hand, aiming for this guy's head, and his aim is so bad he gets his ear instead. But here, he's acting cowardly, not before a man, but before a servant girl. Now, you notice how it was mentioning another disciple. This is typically referred to another way of referring uh, John, referring to him himself. He doesn't like to mention his own name. He's the, he's the disciple that Jesus loved, or he's another disciple. Definitely showing humility there. And here we're starting to see Peter's denials. We continue on in verse 16. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who we know is John, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. There's a denial. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. They were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming warming himself. The reason I read that again is because John was more than an acquaintance. Known means like a friend. You're known. The fact that he mentioned Nicodemus and Joseph earlier and later in uh, the Gospel of John may indicate that he knew many prominent Jews, which is why this fits in here. John is saying that he knew people who were in there, prominent Jews who were part of the Sanhedrin. Verse 19. The high priest then questions Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? He didn't realize that he was actually striking the true high priest. Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Annas asks about Jesus' disciples, perhaps um, because he's fearful Jesus does not mention his disciples at all. Again, he is protecting them. He protects them when they come to arrest him in the garden, pointedly saying, who are you after? Making sure that they they know that, look, you're only after me. Making sure he's protecting his disciples, even though the disciples have no idea really what's going on. It's a whirlwind. But God is faithful to provide for his own. Even when we don't know what we need, God is faithful to provide it for us. The disciples didn't realize what kind of danger they were in, but God already knew. So Jesus is making sure he does not even mention his disciples at all. Again, showing his perfect protection. And God doesn't just do that in this moment or that moment. He gives perfect protection to his own all the time. He perfectly equips his people all the time. This is very encouraging to us, especially in dark times. They were concerned about Jesus' claim that he was the Son of God. They had to question the defendant here, but they had to have witnesses. This This was just a delay tactic here, bringing him to Annas. This is just time for the Sanhedrin to gather, because this is a strange time to be gathering people for a hearing in the middle of the night. They were doing it because they did not want the crowds there. Everything done in secret so that they could get this Jesus out of their hair before the people even realized what had happened. So this is an informal interrogation. 
before Annas. That's what's happening. He's kind of digging around. He's kind of flexing his muscle because even though he's not the true high priest, he used to be, and he is so connected to all the high priests, both current and former, that he still holds a position of prestige and power. And he's using that here, not only to kind of probe the situation, but to delay so that everybody else can gather so that they can meet before the Sanhedrin. See, before the Sanhedrin, they'd have to follow certain rules, like you can't question somebody without witnesses. So Annas is taking every advantage here that he has to question Jesus. It doesn't go the way he expects, though. So now things change. Jesus knows that the law demands that witnesses be called. This is why he was rebuking Annas for what was happening at that very time, while at the same time allowing it to continue being sub submissive to the will of God and his redemptive plan. Jesus says, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me and what I have said to them. That's his way of saying, well, just ask some witnesses, which is a, a coy way of saying there's no witnesses here. This is not legal, what you are doing right now. Jesus wasn't being uncooperative. He's just asserting his legal rights. There was no formal charge until witnesses had been heard. He knew this. He knew it was the high priest's duty to call forth witnesses. And he knew that Annas was not the high priest. It's Caiaphas. Really what's happening here is Jesus is, is asking for a fair trial. Although he knew he would not get one. That too is part of God's redemptive plan. Verse 25. We're flipping back and forth between the scene with Jesus and the scene with Peter. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So those around him say to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? And Peter denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Weren't you the guy with horrible aim? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. That final, the final fulfillment of Jesus' prediction that Peter would do that very thing in Matthew 26. It's not Peter's faith that fails, it's his courage. He, he did believe that Jesus was the Son of God. It wasn't his faith that failed, it was his courage that failed. And after his failure, he weeps bitterly. He weeps bitterly because his courage failed. Because his faith is genuine, but his courage didn't live up to the depth of his faith. He really does love his Lord. But he failed him. Which is why he weeps bitterly. In other Gospels, we see how Jesus looks across and makes eye contact with him. Can you imagine... Oh. Jesus is brought before Pilate. Others' Gospels will emphasize Jesus' trial before the Jewish Sanhedrin, but John emphasizes his trial before the Roman authorities. And that's important. Verse 28, Then they led Jesus from the house of, to Caiaphas, house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters, so that they would not be defiled, but could eat Passover. We must remember that it is Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, That's a great non-answer, isn't it? Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. That gives away the game, doesn't it? They, that is their ultimate goal. The only reason we're here is because we want to put him to death. And we can't. Only you can do that. This was done, verse 32, to fulfill the word that Jesus has spoken, to show by what kind of death he was going to die. If the Jews would have killed him, he would have died by stoning. That would have been the law in Jewish culture, but they couldn't do that because the Romans wouldn't allow them to make any kind of capital punishments. They had to go through Rome. 
You notice that they themselves didn't go into the, into the place where Pilate was. They did not want to be defiled. What hypocrites. What hypocrites. What irony. John is exposing the fact that these people are hypocrites. These priests are hypocrites. They will murder an innocent man because it serves their purposes, yet they do not want to be ceremonially defiled by going into the place where Pilate is. What hypocrites. What self-serving hypocrites. You praise me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me indeed. So they won't go into the headquarters of the commanding officer of the Roman military, but they'll certainly come to him in order to help, have him help them get their, their goals met of getting Jesus out of their hair. This happened early in the morning. It would have been around 6 a.m., so this is even early for those standards. They do not want to be defiled because in Jewish tradition, anyone entering the place of a Gentile would become ceremonially unclean. And again, this is Passover. They don't want to be unclean. But how silly is it to not want to be unclean in that sense, but have no problem with being made unclean by putting to someone who is truly innocent to death? What irony. What irony. Pilate kind of sniffs something's not quite right here. He's not an idiot. Might be a fool, but he's not an idiot. You take him and judge him according to your law. It's early. What are you doing here? Why are you bothering me? Pilate would rather not take the case. This is his way. I don't want to deal with this. Yet the Jews want him to take it so that they can have him lawfully kill Jesus. They they push for the crucifixion unknowingly fulfilling God's word. He wants, Pilate wants nothing to do with it. They remind him that we're not permitted. You have told us the Rome, when, when Rome took over Israel, one of the things that came into place was that capital punishment could only be fulfilled by Romans. So we're just following the law. This is all done so that saying of Jesus and that God's word might be fulfilled. That when Jesus said in John 3.14 that he would be lifted up, that he would be sacrificially killed on the cross when he is lifted up, the only way that could have happened is if the Romans were the ones to put him to death. If, again, if the Jews would put him to death for blasphemy, claiming that he's the son of God, the, the, the law for blasphemy is stoning to death. Jesus didn't predict that he would, or prophesy that he was going to be killed by stoning. He said that he would be lifted up. And here we see again, even through horrible circumstances, unfair, unjust circumstances, God's perfect will is being fulfilled. The same is true in our lives. Even if we go through difficult or hard circumstances, you can trust that the Lord God's will is being fulfilled through those things because he is sovereign over every molecule. And over everything. Jesus is lifted up. And we are saved because of it. My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus is going to start to say here. Verse 33. Pilate is going to question Jesus. Jesus is going to clarify. Pilate enters his headquarters again. And called Jesus and said to him. Are you the king of the Jews? Gets right to it. Right? Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? This is, this is a doubtful question that Pilate is asking. Are you king of the Jews? Jesus doesn't look like a criminal. Jesus doesn't look like a a religious zealot. He doesn't look like a revolutionary. He doesn't match the description of the guys that Pilate is used to seeing. Those are the only people who are crazy enough to claim to be king of the Jews in the direct face of Rome. So Pilate is doubtful here. Jesus clarifies the question. Are you speaking for yourself or has somebody else said this to you? He does this because the Roman conception of a, of a king, to the Romans, king means a political rival. 
Though Jesus was a king, he was not a political rival. Jesus is a king, but he's not a political rival to the Romans, which is what Pilate would have been concerned with. So Jesus is very wise to clarify that. He continues. Jesus answered, verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I would not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Jesus here is declaring the the difference between God's kingdom and the kingdoms of the world. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. It's heavenly. That's totally different. It's not a political difference here. Jesus is speaking spiritually once again when everyone around him is thinking physically. My kingdom is not from here. Earthly kingdoms have a purpose in that they restrain wickedness, they preserve order, but they're very different from the kingdom of God. The heavenly kingdom of which Jesus is the king of is based on love, humility, sacrifice. Totally different than the kingdoms of this world. It's based on holiness, righteousness. Totally different than the kingdoms of this world. As 1 Corinthians 1 says, to Jews it's a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness. That's what the kingdom of heaven is to to the Jews and to the Gentiles who do not believe. The key to living in Jesus' kingdom is not found in trying to rule over other things. It's not found in the same priorities that earthly kingdoms have, but in what is important in the spiritual kingdom of God. Righteousness, holiness, humility, love, sacrifice. In Jesus' day, they were conditioned to look for salvation or saving through political solutions. That's why people were looking for a Savior, but not a Savior from their sin. They were looking for a Savior from the Romans, someone to come in politically and militarily, take the reins, beat up the Romans, kick them out of Israel, and bring them to their proper place. That's what most people wanted and what most people were looking for. That is not the kind of Savior the Messiah is. He's a Savior from sin. A Savior from the great fall. A Savior from our unholiness. A giver of righteousness by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and what He has done. So Jesus is saying here that my, my kingdom, my kingdom, has no kind of national entity It is not political. It's not earthly in the sense that you're used to dealing with other kingdoms. This kingdom is completely different. Completely different. It doesn't even have an origin in the evil system of the world that every other political system or kingdom is rooted in. He's saying, look, if my kingdom was of this world, my servants would have fought. I wouldn't even be here. It's his evidence to Pilate. That my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, I wouldn't be here. My people would have fought. One day, that will happen at Jesus' second coming. Jesus is trying to say that my kingdom is no threat to the nation Israel. My heavenly kingdom is no threat to Rome in the sense of political threat. It's not even of this world. My kingdom is spiritually speaking. My focus is spiritual speaking. I came to spiritually be a savior. Pilate may have been relieved at Jesus' answer that his kingdom is not of this world because he wouldn't have known whose kingdom is stronger. Instead, he's like, oh, this guy's just nuts. This guy's talking about something else. Pilate obviously not thinking spiritually either. Verse 37, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Listen to this. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? 
After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. What is truth? What a, what a practical politician he was. I have no interest in, in philosophical debates. I have no interest in, in philosophy. What is truth? Eh. I find no guilt in him. I find no fault in him. Truth was all that Jesus was concerned about. Instead of being concerned about his rights, his power, his... No, to Pilate, Jesus came across as someone who's only concerned about truth. This is no man who is a thought to me. I don't need to take him seriously. There's no threat here. This is what Pilate is thinking. For Pilate, no doubt, political power is truth. Soldiers are truth. Military strength, Rome is truth. Caesar and his absolute, seemingly absolute power is absolute. Jesus knew what real truth was, though, didn't he? While well, Pilate is, is still seeking and grasping on to, to the same kind of things that earthly people hang on to today when it comes to truth. Money, power, prestige, fame, things of the world. So... Jesus is just thinking about truth and spiritual truth. That's his focus, even in the face of death. He's not trying to talk his way out of it. He's not trying to convince him otherwise. He's just speaking truth, God's truth. And that's what he's concerned about. And Pilate's like, this means nothing to me. This is no threat. What is truth? This is a cynical thing for him to say. He was a cynic. This goes to show us that there are some that God has not given to the Son and some who He has. Everyone who hears the truth hears my voice. Jesus is claiming what we see in John 6.44 all the way back then. That no one can come to the Father unless the Father draws them to Himself. This is why we pray and ask for God to save those that we love. Those of us who have tasted God's grace who didn't know that that's what we needed until God saved us by loving us first, we now love Him. That's why we pray for our loved ones, our neighbors, our enemies, our, our co-workers. That's why we pray for them, that God would open their eyes and their ears, that He would do the same thing in them that He has done in us. Because we recognize that it is all originative from God. God makes it clear that Jesus was not guilty of any sin or crime because Pilate comes out and says, look, I find no guilt in this guy. So it's very clear that Jesus is innocent, blameless, upright, sinless. It also highlights just how unjust what's about to happen is. Both the Jews and the Romans are putting to death a completely innocent man. I find no fault in him at all. This is Pilate declaring Jesus not guilty. Describe it more clearly than that. I challenge you. I find no guilt in this man. Not guilty. Jesus, who was tried by a Roman governor, was declared innocent, and he still went to the cross. That's injustice. But that injustice was all part of God's perfect, redemptive plan. Verse 39. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cry out again. Not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. This should not even be a thing. This moment in time should not even be happening. Jesus was innocent, he's not guilty. But Pilate's a politician. He reads the room. He reads that, you know, uh, I can't just let him go because then all these other people are going to be mad at me. So his concern has nothing to do with truth. His concern is about politics. I can't just let him go, even though he's completely innocent. So now he's searching for other ways, right? Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? He's looking for an easy way to escape this decision about Jesus. He doesn't want to put an innocent man to death necessarily, right? He's not jumping at the chance for that. It's not like he really cares, but that's not ideal. So he's not jumping at that chance. So he's looking for another way out. 
So he brings up this tradition, another way out perhaps. But he's thwarted in this because the crowd shouts, not this man, but Barabbas. Pilate hoped that the crowd would release Jesus and then his hands are, are free of it, right? Nothing I can do. That's what the people wanted. It's what a politician would love to be able to say that. But now Pilate finds it impossible to go against the Jewish leaders and the crowd. His situation becomes worse. Now instead of releasing Jesus and having just the political leaders of the Israelites against him, now he knows that the crowd will be against him. The people will be against him. And he can't go against both. Even if it's for an innocent man. What a cruel scene. This is a Roman governor trying to win the life of Jesus against the efforts of his own people. How could the crowd turn against Jesus? This is the same man that they followed around hoping that he would cure them or do some kind of miracle. But many of them were disappointed that this Messiah who rode into Jerusalem didn't do what they expected the Messiah to do. Again, they're not thinking spiritually. They're not thinking God is holy and I am not. And I need someone to bridge that gap and make me holy because I can't do it myself. They're not thinking in that way spiritually. They're thinking, woe is me. I hate being ever underneath the boot of the Roman officials. I want someone to come in and beat their bottoms and chase them out of Jerusalem. Yip, 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 yip. I want them to establish a, a, a kingdom in Israel like the, day, the golden days of old. That's what I want. That's what they were looking for. That's the Messiah they wanted. And that's the ones, the people who were cheering when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. That's why they were cheering for him. They weren't saying, here's the Savior of the world who will take away my sins. No, they're saying, ah, here's the one who will set us free from Roman rule. He wasn't the Messiah they wanted. There's also a tendency in many people to tear down heroes that they have built up. You see that in culture today as well. Cancel culture. Uh, Jesus wasn't what, he, what they wanted. Jesus wasn't exactly what they were looking for. He's kind of on the downtrend. Jump on the boat. Kick him while he's down. So the crowd rejects Jesus and embraces Barabbas, whose name means son of the father. How interesting. Barabbas' name means son of the father. Barabbas? Son of the Father. Jesus, Son of the Father, capital F. How interesting that, and, and, and how foretelling that these people, the sinful man, right? Worldly, sinful man is standing at the bottom of a staircase where two men are presented to him. Two different sons of the Father. You can choose Barabbas, who is the earthly, sinful son of the Father. Self-rule, do everything your way, He's son of a father, that side. Or you can choose Jesus Christ, who is a true son, capital S, of the Father, capital F, who represents holiness, righteousness, submission to God, and obedience to God and His Word. And what does sinful man choose? Sinful man chooses the unthinkable. Sinful man always chooses sin. The son of the Father who is a robber, who is a murderer, who is a thief, Barabbas. Instead of Jesus Christ. How? How can you do this? This is how depraved we are. This is how sinful we are. He is a robber. One who seizes things. One who plunders. Not just a, a thief and a robber, but like a guerrilla terrorist. You know, Taliban's in the news right now. This would be like the leader of the Taliban. Who would you rather have set free? Jesus or the leader of the Taliban? And people choosing the leader of the Taliban, knowing that he's a thief, a murderer, a terrorist. It's crazy. How? What? How? How could you set this great sinner free? There's another parallel here. That while there's two sons of the father on display, Barabbas, earthly, sinful, worldly, and Jesus, heavenly, holy, righteous, there's also the sense that we just saw Jesus take the penalty that he didn't deserve for Barabbas, who did deserve that penalty. 
So there's that other parallel. How can you set such a great sinner free? I could be in Barabbas' place. How? How is it right in any playbook that Jesus Christ, who is perfect, blameless, sinless, and upright, that He should be killed for me and that I, a great sinner, should be set free? How is that right? It's not. Barabbas could say, oh, Jesus died for me in a physical sense. We can say that Jesus died for me in a spiritual sense. In a spiritual sense, I'm Barabbas. I'm a dirty, filthy sinner who is so in love with his sin that I would run and and I had no care for Christ, no care for God, no care for His Word. I wanted self-rule. Whatever made me feel good was what I wanted. I didn't care about God or His ways, yet He loved me before I ever loved Him. He came and stood on those steps and He took my place. I was the one who deserved death. I'm the one who deserved death. All that Jesus took for me. Jesus died on my behalf. The innocent for the guilty. What a powerful, what a powerful picture. What a great Savior. Let's pray. Father, we are completely dependent upon You. How do we ever thank You? Uh, I am not who I used to be. I am not who I want to be. And Lord, who I am now, I I don't serve you, love you, worship you, obey you the way I want to or should. And it shames me when I read passages like this and think of Jesus standing on top of those stairs, completely innocent, pure, and righteous, and taking the punishment that we all deserve. I am ashamed of, of how I have lived for you. And we all are if we're honest with ourselves. So I ask that you would help us keep this picture in our minds and in our hearts so that we might be filled with a holy desire to serve you, to live for you, to sacrifice ourselves for you like you did for us so that your name might be glorified, that your gospel might be shared, that you might be honored, that you might find our lives and every part of it, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, that you might find them pleasing to you. Lord, help us. Turn us into such Christians like that through the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, for we pray and ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.